and I believe we are live, Tom. Everybody that's watching, even if it's just us two, uh, Tom does a uh, show on the Houston Astros on the Relevant app. Uh, he has a YouTube channel, and uh, he's a big Astros fan, so I figured I'd bring Tom on. I've been on the Relevant app with him and Rob uh, the last couple of days. I've actually been hopping on. I, I have no video because I have an Android, but I've been been talking to Tom and Rob and uh, Sean on Relevant. And uh, if you don't have that app, go get that app. And I'm looking at the chat. I think it's just us here. It always starts that way sometimes. It's no big deal. Good evening, Dre. Uh, when the people come in, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in here talking baseball with you. Really looking forward to uh, talking about the Strohs. I mean, coming off a big win after a couple disappointing losses. And then obviously we can get into the whole spectrum of Major League Baseball. You know, the trade deadline's coming up. There's there's going to be some moves made, I think. I think, uh, you know, the team in the background over there, the Cubs are going to be interesting because some people thought they'd be sellers. Now only three games back, they might be buyers. Who knows? Um, I guess we can get into it, kick it off right with the uh, Astros. Uh, as a big Astros fan, how are you feeling about the progress of uh, Jordan? I mean, other than the injury stuff, he's been amazing. There's no way in the world that you told me when they traded for him uh, that they were going to get this type of player. I don't think the Dodgers thought they were trading this type of player away. And Jordan has been the superstar that this team sorely needed. You know, year after year, this team has had turnover because of some great talent going out and seeking bigger dollars. And they've been able to find guys to step in that role. You know, when George Springer left, it became a Kyle Tucker thing. When Carlos Correa left, it became a Jeremy Pena thing. And Jordan has just kind of grown up with this team. And even the pitching staff with the rotation, when you talk about guys like Garrett Cole leaving and Justin Verlander leaving, and then you're turning the ball over to Fran Valdez and Christian Javier, and they're not missing a beat. It's just been a, a really great job by that front office to keep young talent churning and then to infuse it with guys. They've made moves every year to make this team better, whether it was Zach Greinke or Christian Vasquez. Those moves all you know had a, had a place where – it was it was a, a a punch in the arm for the team for the clubhouse, knowing that this team was committed to winning, and for the last six years they've made it to the uh, American League Championship Series, and also been to the World Series many times in that in that time frame. So, it's it's a fun time to be an Astros fan. I don't think I don't think this is slowing down. I know the fan base is a little upset right now because they're not doing what they thought they would be doing. They've had tons of adversity. They've been dealing with it all season long, injuries in and out. Guys that have not even picked the ball or had an at bat for the team, like Michael Brantley and, and Lance McCullers Jr. So I'm really interested to see what they do. With with that, one of one of your guys' biggest offseason moves is uh, Jose Jose Abreu. And I'm an old school baseball guy. I don't think that um, the way the way the Jose Abreu thing is panning out, I don't think that it is the sky is falling. I think he's trying to get adjusted to his surroundings in Houston and find out where he fits into this because I think this Astros team is different than years past. Um, they have a band of they've just got a kind of like a band of misfit toys. And there, Dusty Baker is trying to figure out his lineup, and I think it's frustrating to the fans because they want they want Jordan to play every day, and Jose Abreu is not hitting. If Jose Abreu was hitting 300, I don't think it would be that. I don't think his role should be. It's because Jordan is out right now, and I feel like the Abreu on the Twitter's Astro or Astro's Twitter is what I call it is rough. It is not uh, Abreu's in the doghouse and Dusty's in the, in the doghouse essentially. And then um, I just, I feel like Bregman is, 
been playing well. Kyle Tucker has been solid. I just I just feel like that the Astros are a front of the rotation type of guy away from being a, a, a bigger bigger contender because I think if they add a bat in a front of the rotation guy, I think they're the dead on favorite to win the World Series. You know, I totally agree with you in that sentiment. I think that pitching is where this team sorely lacks. However, if you listen to Dana Brown, if you listen to their general manager, he's he's adamant about adding a bat. He really feels that the offense needs more attention than the rotation, and the numbers back it up. A lot has been made of Jose Arquiti going down, Luis Garcia going down, and having to go out and bring these young guys in. J.P. France, Brandon Belak, Ronel Blanco. And even Hunter Brown to an extent. Hunter Brown was supposed to be in this rotation, but I don't think he was supposed to be as leaned on as heavily to be counted on his wins. He was going to be the fifth starter. So these guys have all pitched amazing coming out of Sugarland in their minor league system. And it's kind of like the numbers say they're okay, even though the fan base will tell you, I'd rather have more than enough pitching and not have to count on a young guy that wasn't pitching with the big league club last year. Um, you spoke to the, the offense. You spoke to Jose Abreu. Jose Abreu, I think, is somebody that everybody saw the number, the dollar signs, what it cost to get him. You got to think, too, the, the position that he filled, a, a fan favorite, an icon, a guy that had been so great for them for so many years in Yuli Gurriel. So, one, he came in with a slow start. And I think part of that was because he was pressing. He was really trying to impress his new club. When he got introduced, when he came on the scene, he was like, man, I'm so happy to be here. These are the world champions. These are the best guys. He felt that pressure to perform for his team, to show that he was worthy of the money, to show that he belonged on a team with champions. He'd been with the Chicago White Sox. They hadn't really lived up to the expectations. He had done great things for them, but they'd never been a top-tier club and I think that was his thing that he was trying to prove to himself and to his teammates that he belonged with them. So he pressed and he pressed and he pressed. And now you're finally starting to see him come out of that shell and start to play really well. The last like six weeks, he's been a totally different guy. And I think you're going to see, see him to continue that. The, the, the hard hit contact is up. You know, he's starting to hit homers more frequently. He's knocking in runs. He's got, I think he's third on the team in hits. So I think Jose Abreu would be just fine. But this team has just been struck with adversity from day one. You, you talk about the World Baseball Classic. Jose Altuve gets plunked in the thumb. He's out from the from the beginning of the, the season. So you got guys like Mauricio Dubon that stepped in and, and have, have stepped in admirably, but it's not Jose Altuve. Uh, Michael Brantley was expected to be ready by opening day. He still hasn't seen the field. So the lineup that a lot of people were promised going into the season, we've never seen it. Kyle Tucker, another guy, huge numbers last year, 30 home runs, 107 RBIs, expected to be even better or at least the same with the abandonment of the shift. He's down a few, I'd say he's probably down five home runs and about 20 RBIs from the pace that he was on last year. So when you talk about those numbers, the offense just hasn't been able to keep up with the pitching. And that's why it's a team that's eight games over 500 and not 15 games over 500 and right on top of Texas for the division. When when you bring those numbers into it and not having the lineup you thought you were going to have opening day, I feel like that is what – because I had start started following Sean um, about a few weeks after opening day. I was listening to his show, and it and I feel like it just slowly unraveled to where Astros Twitter is what it is now because it's blame Dusty, it's get rid of this guy, trade him, we need this, we need that. And I don't think that is the answer. I think Hunter Brown has pitched really well. Framers pitched well, like you said. And the the biggest spot, I guess, in the last 10 days has been Rafael Montero. I We were talking about that the other night on the on the relevant stream that I brought up his mechanics and I feel like his pitching mechanics were 
the biggest issue with his outing last night with the Dodgers when he went against the Dodgers. And I think that they're not going to send him down. They're just going to try to fix it on the fly. So, I mean, his ERA is ballooned. He is not not looking good, and they paid him a bunch of money for a relief pitcher, and I feel that he needs to fix his mechanics and keep working because, you know, in baseball you play almost every day and it's a new day. And if he gets hot down the stretch, we're not even going to be talking about this, about, you know, we'll call it the first hundred games, you know, dead zone or, or just complete crap show. And I feel like Dana Brown is tired of losing six to seven ball games. And I feel like that's why he wants a bat just to, to take some of the pressure off JP France and Hunter Brown and Frommer. I feel that that's that's where that's where they're going with this. Um, and when it comes to the Rangers and the Angels, the Angels have always been inconsistent. The having the two best players in baseball and not really doing anything, and well, they kind of got better. I think everybody around the Astros got better, and they had like a medium off season, like a mid off season, as far as adding pieces. And also, I think the Rangers have a hell of a manager in Bruce Bochy. Not to take anything away from Dusty Baker, but, I mean, I think Bochy's probably the best manager they've had in a while. So, I don't think that... I mean, because I just look at the... I'm looking at the pitching stats right now, and I just... I don't know how this team is only eight games over 500. It's because the bats aren't producing... And I feel the biggest issue that the Astros have is um, with men in scoring position. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, – it's, it's, it's out there. The numbers are out there. They back what you're just saying. It's interesting because you talked about the offseason, how you felt like it was a mid-offseason. A lot of people within Houston, at least that I spoke to, you know, in Twitter and so, so forth, thought that the Astros didn't have holes to fill. It was a first baseman, and it was a reliever, maybe. You know, address the bullpen, some. And they pretty much did that. They brought back a guy that was nails for them the year before. A lot of people forget how great Montero was last year. Uh, the life of a reliever is definitely, what have you done for me lately? Uh, a guy like Phil Maton, who people are counting on this year to be really good, was really bad for stretches last year. Brian Abreu, another guy, guys are counting on to be that next guy. Some people talked about being a potential closer down the road. Was very, very bad to start the season last year. So I think it's ebbs and flows with relievers. You know, they find it, they lose it, they get back to it. Montero is is not the seven pit, you know, seven ERA guy that he is now. He's probably not the two point five guy that he was last year either. His career numbers, I think, are four or five or something like that, and he's probably closer to that. I don't think he's a bad reliever. I think you made a great call on the relevant app for all y'all that aren't doing it. You got to get out there. It's a great time. We really chop it up. We talk all things baseball. You can get on the mic. You can get in the front of the camera, speak your piece, let your, let yourself be heard. And I think it's a great way to, you know, interact with fans in like a sports bar tailgate type setting. And um, you called it talking about his mechanics and, you know, that's something I still got to go back and look at, but I think you're probably onto something that he's missing something somewhere when he gets wild that he just loses it. And then when he tries to find it again, he's, he's having to come to the heart of the plate in hitters friendly counts and they're tagging him. So I think that's something that hopefully he gets squared away. I don't think Dusty Baker is going to go away from him. I think he might give him a few extra days, but I still think he's going to use him. Dusty's a player's manager. I think he's going to always show faith in his players to an extent. I think he's got favorites, but I think that Montero is one of his guys and that he's going to find a way to get him right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, I think Rob got a little mad when we were talking about the mechanics and the, in because I, I, he's in Mon, Montero's and is in Rob's doghouse big time, big time. <laughs> and um, I think that, I think that Dusty will, he will figure out the bullpen 
whether they make changes. I think that is coming, but listening to the callers on Sports Talk, I don't know if you've listened to Sports Talk 790. Sometimes in the morning on my way to work, definitely. Sometimes on my way home, but it's a different crew. I like to listen to Sean and Lalima and Ryan in the mornings. Um, the guys in the afternoon, they're always talking something crazy, whether it's basketball or football, which I listen to also, but I don't go for them, go to them for my baseball content. Yeah. And, you know, hearing a lot of, because in the morning, it's, you know, a couple hours after the game. If they lose, there is just a ton of dusty hate. And I think I made some people upset the other night in the relevant app because we had two people jump off automatically when I said, okay, well, if you want to get rid of it, you want to blame Dusty, you want to get rid of Dusty, who are you going to get? Yeah, That's- but I think I think a lot of those people have known, like we have known in Houston for a while, that Joe Espada has pretty much been promised that job, and a lot of people really think he's going to be a new up-and-coming manager. And Dusty gets caught up sometimes making some questionable decisions that just seem like they're outdated. And and maybe I'm way off base, but I know the old ways of doing things kind of come out with Dusty sometimes. And sometimes they work and we're going, aha, see, the Wiley veteran got it right. And then other times you're kind of like, why did we do that, Dusty? The numbers would say you do this or play this guy or bring this guy. You know, the rules are different now. Back in the day when he was the manager, and, and I say back in the day, I mean, he's been a manager this entire time. But primarily when he was a manager, you could, you could bring in as many relievers as you wanted. Now a guy's got to face three batters. And then you worry about running up another guy and, and taxing another guy. So I think he's just hesitant to do that. I think he stayed with Montero too long the other night. And that's the old way of doing things. And that's just my opinion. Well... If, if we break down the whole Montero thing as a whole, looking at it as a whole, you had – he gets two quick outs, and then he hit Mookie, and then it then he was at the top of the lineup. If he doesn't hit Mookie Betts, I think he gets out of that inning. And this whole getting rid of Montero or talking about DN, DFA and him, all of that goes away. I don't know if it all goes away because the 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 DFA Montero talk's been about two weeks now. He's been bad for about five starts or five appearances, I should say. And it's not something that's gotten better. It's only gotten worse. And I think that if you're if Dusty, if Dusty wants to build trust, I am all there for it. But at the same time, you gotta also think about this guy's psychological too, right? If you let him out there and you let him keep getting shelled, well, that's that's not going to build him up either. That's only going to make it harder. I think the fact that he left him in there to face Freddie Freeman, to face Will Smith, probably hurt him. You know, like like because what you didn't want to happen was him to go out there and get shellacked, and then now I'm still with a guy that's struggling with uh, you know psychologically he's not right. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing is like I said, the six inches between the ears and baseball is the most humbling game that you can play out of the three majors. In my opinion, I just, I just feel the, the Montero stuff is it's getting, getting to where I think they might have to make a change. And um, on the other side of that coin, that whole Dodger series, the starting rotation, I'd give them an a plus. They had all all three of them had quality quality starts and uh, the the stream before the Dodgers series. I think I talked to Sean on Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, and he was talking about this Dodger series is huge, and all roads lead to Arlington for that four game set over Fourth of July, and that is that is going to be the telltale sign because I said we either have to split or one and three going into the deadline. And I think that that Rangers series will tell how this, how the season will go. And I also believe that the, um, 
I think it'll dictate some things at the trade deadline. And it could be if they go, if Houston goes to Arlington and sweeps them, that is a big that would be a big statement. And then it's it's dead nuts going to the All Star game and with the trade deadline coming up. Well, I mean, I think it's going to be a great series. I think that it is going to either make this uh, this division tighter or it's going to like provide Texas the breathing room they need to probably run away and hide a little bit. I don't think it's going to be a be all end all. Okay. If the Astros get swept, they're sellers. Now, you know, they're say they're seven games back in the division, but they're still with the last wild card spot. I don't see them going up. Oh, we can't catch Texas. We're done here. Let's, let's try to get some, some pieces. Let's move some guys. Let's try to reshuffle the deck and, and look for next year. I don't think that's the case. I think what happens possibly out of this series is if the Astros are able to, like you said, win or sweep, then I think that motivates Texas to go make some moves. I think Texas now says we don't have enough and we need to go add because I think, that, and, and I've said this on the relevant app and in, in pods that I've done, I think that Texas is is playing o- o- over their skis a little bit. You look at some of the guys in their lineup that are hitting career numbers. You look at some of the guys in their rotation that are having career years. Nobody expected Nathan Eovaldi to be this guy. He was a free agent that anybody could have had. Uh, Leody Tavares, Jonah Heim. These are names that, that are not 300 hitters. They're not big boppers. I mean, they've got guys that have talent. Nobody's taking anything away from Simeon or Seager, but – the rest of these guys, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess they're capable, but I think eventually they're going to regress back to the mean a little bit, and that's where you're going to see them struggle a little bit. And the last couple of games to the Yankees, they did not look good. They, the Yankees are a team that's reeling, and they won that series. Yeah, and I also think in baseball, water always finds its level. Um, these guys, them, them guys that you mentioned, down in Arlington, I I just feel that at some point the music's going to stop. But if it doesn't, the Astros have to add to. It's an arms race in the in the AL West. It's an arms race. I wouldn't be worried about Seattle. They're way too inconsistent. They have no bats, and they just they're streaky. They're good at home. I'll give them that. But you know, looking around. If we pivot towards, you know, I'm going to pull up the standings right now. Um, the Rays, who would have thought Tampa, Tampa Bay would have do what they were doing? And, you know, I've, I've asked Sean this. I said, okay, if you're going to have a seller in the American League East, who is it? You know. I don't, I don't think you will. That, that whole division, Susie, uh, one of the hosts on the relevant app, uh, she's also a host of a pod called Bourbon and Baseball. She calls that whole division a wagon because it's just fat. Yeah, you know, they got so much talent. The 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 worst place team would be a first place team in the American League Central. I mean, that whole division is is probably in it for the long haul. Because because I asked uh, Sean and those guys this. I said when they were asking. You know what? Who who's possibly available? And nobody brought up anybody in the American League East. And I I I thought that that division was going to cannibalize itself. And it's you know, as I'm looking at the numbers, I mean, Tampa Bay's got a sizable lead, but you know, if they drop three out of four series, you know, Baltimore's the first place team. And I think New York is going to struggle down the stretch because I don't believe they have enough pitching. Toronto's just too inconsistent for me. And the Red Sox, I don't know how they're one game over 500, how they've won 40 games to this point. I don't think they're that good. But they're they're not really good at home. The only thing that stands out in the American League is the Rays and the Rangers' run differential. They're plus 150 for the Rays and plus 152 for the Rangers. And... If they're mashing the ball that well, out of their last 10, they're 5-5. Five and five. So something tells me that the music will eventually stop down there in Arlington. But I also do think that the Angels, 
I'm going to be really shocked at what they do at the deadline because I've heard, you know, the Otani grumblings. And I think if I was an Angels fan, if you traded Otani, I would burn that stadium to the ground. I can't see a scenario where they trade Otani. I know a lot of people want that to happen. I think it's one of those things that that would be a sexy move that would move the needle. Media coverage would be everywhere. You know, seeing him in another jersey, this and that. But I truly believe that Anaheim is committed to trying to keep him and Mike Trout in Angels uniform for the next 10 years. And they're going to spend all the money to do so. I, I, I mean, it's really going to depend on Otani and whether or not he's committed to that city or if he's just going to force his way out. But then I believe he's got one more year of arbitration, I think. And if that's the case, I think next offseason or next trade deadline is when you see Otani move, not this one. Especially now where they're where they're in, you know, shouting range of a playoff spot as well. Here's here's the thing. Um, since we're on the Otani, the only thing I can think that Otani can do is if let's say Let's say the Rangers completely fall apart in the second half, which it's totally possible, but I'm saying it's not likely. If they completely fall apart and Houston wins the division, like I put in the show's tagline, and the Angels sneak in the playoffs, I think they'll be able to they'll be able to get the Otani deal done. So I don't know if the Angels have enough to do that. I think that's asking a lot. They're going to have to be incredibly hot to be able to catch, I guess, Texas and pass them. I, I mean, I know they're only like a half game behind the Strohs, but it's just they're like like you talked about. They're so inconsistent. I was wrong about Otani's contract. He's a free agent at the end of the season. So I, I, I don't know that they have the stones to move him because of how bad that would look. Trout would almost immediately ask to be asked out. They'd have to blow the whole thing up. So I don't I don't see I don't see a scenario where it happens. I just don't. But that's a guy that, that's gonna move the needle for some East Coast or West Coast team because I think that's where he wants to be close enough to 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 home and I guess close enough to you know, the bigger markets, I think that's where he's going to be. Those are the only teams that can really offer him the $500 million that I think he's after. Well, in a perfect world, I as I'm looking at the list of teams that I think would be in the market for him, I don't know if the Mariners have enough pieces and that would be huge in poor taste for them to trade him to the Mariners. But I'm also thinking if he's he's an unrestricted free agent, I think the Yankees would sell, which the Yankees always sell the future, regardless. Um, I think the Yankees would be in, the Red Sox. But the problem you have with Otani is, is that he's like an like an NHL terms he's a rental. And if you think you can win the World Series with him, it would be worth giving up the future to to acquire him for a season because I think he's going to be a Seattle Mariner when he hits free agency. That's wild. I would have thought the Dodgers. The Dodgers make way too much sense to me. It's it's the, the the crown jewel of of LA. It's on the West Coast, which you know it's kind of like within shouting distance of Japan. They're gonna spend all the money. Um, that's where I see him going. I don't think he goes to a team that can't compete. I think when he moves, it's gonna be to a team that he thinks he can win a World Series because he's he's a super competitor. If you watch him in the World Baseball Classic, he willed that team to to that win. And I just, I don't see him settling. I think, you know, this whole experience in, in Anaheim has kind of soured that for him. So his next move, whether it be East Coast or West Coast, is going to be a team that I, I think he's going to say, I can go to win a championship. And I don't, I don't see him saying that in Seattle. 
Well, there was this other guy that played in Seattle for a few years named Ichiro, also from Japan. And I know Ichiro has some role in the front office with the Mariners. And I mean, that, I mean that, that, that may be true, but I don't think he's got enough pull unless he's his uncle to be able to say, hey, come play for me. I mean, there's, there's uh, Asian great players for all those clubs, the Dodgers, yeah. the Yankees. You know, the, the Red Sox, all of them can can point at, you know, past greats that came through there. I don't know. I guess my my thing is I judge guys by their temperament in interviews and Otani's. I don't think he would want to deal with L.A. being a Dodger or a Yankee because he seems like a real private person and because in New York or LA, you're going to be hated no matter what. No matter what you do, because they're going to bring up, we paid you a half a billy, and we're not winning every game. What what are what are you doing? Because I mean, the best gauge for me, and this is through all the sports. Like when I wanted to get when when I seen the relevant app and all that, so I started listening to Sean's show. The national media the major conglomerate that is a four letter word that I don't bring up. They are so out of touch with their beat writer opposed to what the local guys are saying. And I think the internet is kind of flipping that a little bit, flipping that narrative to a certain extent. And I just, I just feel that I feel that Otani, Otani might be a Mariner. I will be the first person to say, you heard it here first. Dre Duke called this thing. And if you weren't listening to him, you made a mistake because I don't think anyone else outside of maybe a, a select Seattle fan would, would agree with you. I, I think the whole MLB was going to be shocked if, you know, he gets traded there or he's a free agent and he goes there like, do I think they would pay him? Sure. You know, that's that's the one knock when people dream about Otani in an Astros uniform. I don't think I don't think the Astros are committed to spending like that. I don't think they're ever gonna give a player a 10-year deal that pays him upwards of 300 to 400 million dollars. I don't think they'll ever be a player. Not Jordan, not Tuck, not Framber, not nobody. It's just not the way Jim Crane sees. Uh, MLB teams that are successful being constructed for him. Will he go six, seven, maybe eight? Sure. Will he pay you the best annual average dollar that you can get? Absolutely. Will he cross those deals to where the last three or four years I'm basically paying you for, you know, the tip of the cap and not the player that you should be. Nope. He won't do it. So while I'd love to find a way to get Otani pitching for the Strohs and batting DH uh, behind Jordan Alvarez, I'll never, ever commit that to memory because I just know what the owner of the Houston Astros looks like with his baseball club. So you you, you didn't use the Bagwell line. Well, the back of the baseball card. That's his. I'm not going to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's jump over to the National League. I don't know how much National League baseball you watch. I like I said, I'm in the transfer portal when it comes to fandom. Well, if you're and looking for a National League club, the Arizona Diamondbacks are impressive. Their minor leagues are stacked. Their young guys are great. Corbin Carroll is a stud. I think that if I was going to – I mean, I'm, I'm pretty loyal to the soil. I try not to, to dip my toes in the National League waters, but if I was, that's where I'd be. Um. As I as I look at the all the teams in the in the National League, um, one that touches close to you, do you think that Verlander's having buyer's remorse, or is he not even worried about it because he's getting paid? Um, it's interesting. I I I definitely wonder if we'll ever find out what what day what the Astros were willing to go to, like. What was the? I I think there was a third year that that he got from the Mets that he wasn't going to get from Houston, but were the were the were the the annual average dollars 
the same. Because if they were, then yes, he absolutely is. Now, if he got five more million to go to New York, then he probably will say, I wanted the extra five million. But if those numbers were the same and all he wanted was one more year in the sun, which I know Jim Crane would have gave him because he had a man crush on Justin Verlander, I think he's definitely regretting his decision because of how bad the Mets are right now and how, how much it doesn't look like it's going to change. Here's, here's another scenario for you, for you, Thomas. Uh, what do you think about Verlander? Do you think Dana Brown picks up the phone and calls the New York Mets about Verlander? No, I don't think so. I, the, the, so far, unless he is totally just playing everyone, Dana Brown in every one of his pregames, because I listen to a lot of uh, the radio uh, broadcasts, at least, at least early on, because uh, Robert Ford, the announcer for um, 740, will interview uh, Dusty will interview Dana and I always like to hear them. I always like to hear it straight from their mouth. So it's not like I'm getting it from somewhere else. And Dana Brown has been adamant about adding a bat. He's always made that line. Well, you know, we'll add a pitcher if we think it helps, if we, we're, we're not ruling anything out, but you know, we've looked at our rotation and our numbers are good. And I think what we really need is a bat, a left-handed bat would be ideal. Somebody that is flexible, that can play all over the place. So we've sat in the relevant app, you know, at length on a couple different games and talked about all the different bats they could go out and get. One of them was recently acquired. Mike Moustakas out of Colorado was acquired by the angels. The angels are trying to make some moves to try to help that team, which further lets me think that they're trying to do what they can to make Otani happy to try to get him a winner. And uh, it just hasn't worked out so far as of yet. Um, That's what I think Dana Brown's going to do. I would love for him to pick up the phone and go get Justin. I, I mean, it doesn't make sense because I think like if you're going to go spend that kind of money, if you're going to go get that kind of picture, go part with some prospects and go get Dylan Cease. Go pay him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Go get me a young guy that's on, on the rise that you can keep this train rolling and then do that and then pay him. Do I, do I love Justin Van Lander? Absolutely. Did I want him to stay? Absolutely. Do I think it makes sense at $43 million or whatever he's making? Probably not. You know, I, I, I mean, he's earned every bit of that. He's earned the right to go earn that money. And I will always be grateful for what he did in Houston. You'll never catch me boo the guy, but there's a better way to build that mousetrap for me. Um, and as we talk about the Mets, they're losing two to one to the Brewers. Top of the eighth. Yeah. Um, and when we were talking last night, that, not to backtrack, but uh, the Montero thing, uh, Steve Sparks was on Sean's show today and they interviewed him. You know what he said what was wrong with Montero? Tell me it was, uh, it was something about his glove being in the wrong place. Yep. That's what they talked about for a whole segment. We we were on top of that first. Badass, um, man. Badass. That's awesome. And it was in um which I I I I shoot some strays at Lima all the all the time on Twitter <laughs> every now and then. But um Lima Lima says he wants to give up on him. And I I think Montero, it's hard for me to let a guy that can throw the ball almost a hundred miles an hour. If you can just fix him, that's all you got to do. Send him to sugar land and fix him. I think when you have the spectrum of where guys are, as far as like conservative or liberal, I feel like I'm on one end of that. And, and Lima's was on the other end. He, when he's done, he's done. He's, you know what? You got to find somewhere else to be. And I, I like to, okay, what can we do? You know what I mean? We talked about guys and 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 not giving up on them, and we talked about guys that went on and they just needed a, a a change of scenery. I mean, Montero may be a guy that if you gave up on him, he'd end up on a Tampa Bay roster and then pitching lights out because yep. they would they would they would scoop him up. All right, let's fix this, get you right, and then all of a sudden he's Jose Siri 2.0. You know, or J.D. Martinez or, you know, the list goes on and on and on. 
But I mean, that's where I'm kind of like, eh. that. It's not like the guy can't get guys out. It's not like we haven't seen it. So I'm I'm with you. I'd rather try to fix it. Um, let's pivot towards the National League Central, which is a slight dumpster fire. The Pirates, out of their last 10, they are 1-9. They are on a huge skid, which I have beef with the Pirates. I have a lot of a lot of friends that live in Pittsburgh, and that they, they live in Pittsburgh, and I got about four friends that are, hey, we're this is our year. We got young guys. We're going to be able to fix this. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then I have four, four friends that want – to get get out the pitchforks and torches and run down to the Hillbilly Prince's Palace in West Virginia and demand he sells the team because I think Bob Nutting is stealing the the money of the of the Pirates fans and the city of Pittsburgh. Just I mean, he cuts payroll every year and they just say, "Well, we're going to, you know, we're going to rebuild and uh, we're small market. You have an NFL team. You're not a small market." I don't know if you've ever You've been to enough Texans games, right? So what it's like in Texas with the NFL team, multiply that by like a billion. That's what it is in in Pittsburgh because I go to a game every year. I'm a Steelers fan. I go to a game every year, and it is the most unreal atmosphere ever, and I don't know how these people can say that we are building a um, – if you hear somebody yelling, it's my son in the background. Uh, it's all good. But um, it is just wild on how on how this team continuously steals money from the team. I mean, it's really interesting when you look at the differences between the Steelers and their storied history and how they've built a consistent model of excellence from the head coach down. And then you look at the Pirates where it's been just like a carousel. They've had amazing talent come through there and they've never quite been able to get it all together at the same time. They've never quite been able to get enough of it together to get management and ownership to buy in. I think this year is the first time I've actually seen them spend real money to go keep a guy that most people thought they were going to trade in Brian Reynolds. And, you know, I thought this, this was the turnaround. This was the come up, you know, they brought Kutch back, which I thought was a great move. That was a fan favorite was going to, you know, energize, put butts in the seats, you know, good young team had some good young pitching. They win and they 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 stirred the pot with some guys, some older guys, and they got some good, decent starts in the, out of the gate. Started out really well. However, I think they just ran out of steam, and you know the shine kind of let off. And and these other teams, Milwaukee, St. Louis, the Cubs, you know that that whole division is not great. And I think the Pirates can still do some things, but I think they kind of re- reversed back to the mean a little bit, and that's where now they've got to figure out: all right, are we going to fight for this thing or not? And they may very well be a seller at the trade deadline. I think the Pirates will be a seller because they always are. Um, the last time that they that they added was when they got AJ Burnett, and it is with me with the Pirates. They cut payroll and then they don't add, and then they like they traded Neil Walker to the Mets for a bag of chips. None of them guys panned out. They sell their major assets to get other young assets to try to maybe catch the Cubs. That was like, it was telling to me when the Cubs went on the World Series run, when they won the World Series, we we marched out Arietta and he stuffed the bats up their backsides, essentially is what he did to them. And then they they the pirates went into the cellar they sold everybody off burnett retired and then that was that and then they were bad they they were like 19 and 41 during covid and and the cubs weren't great although i think ricketts completely hit the the fuck it button and got rid of everyone he got rid of everyone he got rid of chris bryant he got rid of brizzo 
He got rid of Chapman. He got rid of it all, which I'm still shocked to this day that Joe Madden managed them to a World Series win because Joe Madden is probably one of the worst managers to ever win a World Series. And I don't know how people. Wow, that's that's a hot take. When you talk about what he was able to do in Tampa and then go up there, I mean, it kind of validated him. To a certain extent, but if you didn't watch that club day in, day out, 2015, 2016, I was watching every Cubs game. That was back when I had the MLB package before it went stupid Um, because the Cubs were head and shoulders better than everybody. They got rid of Schwarber. They got rid of everyone off that team. And then they're trying to rebuild. Stroman's nice, but I think they'll trade him. I really do. They've won a couple games recently, so people think, you know, with them being only a couple games out of the Central, that they might not turn around and trade off pieces that could help them win. I really, I mean, I don't know what the Cubs are doing, to be honest. It's, it's, they're, they're, they're very streaky right now. And I mean, like you said, they've got some good young talent. But back, getting back to the Pirates, I think this whole thing hinged on O'Neill Cruz. When that kid got hurt, you know, it really took the wind out of their sails. And he's going to be electric, you know, when he gets back. So I, I really think that the Pirates do have something they can build with. It's just going to be interesting to see if they can get it all together at the same time and actually make something of it. That, w- that was like uh, the Garrett Cole deal when he went to Houston. I, I knew that was going to happen. I seen that one coming because <laughs> Garrett Cole always wanted to be a Yankee and he wanted out of Pittsburgh. He didn't want to be there. And it validated him because at the time Clint Hurdle was the manager and they wanted their big push through the Pirates was is they wanted guys to pitch to contact. And Garrett Cole doesn't pitch to contact anymore and look at what he's doing. So I think that he he was kind of <laughs> right on that front. And then uh, the, the Reds, I don't know how they're in first place. Uh, I'll I tell you. I'll tell you, they brought up all their young kids at the same time, and they're playing for each other. They brought that 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 kid uh, Ellie De La Cruz up. They brought up uh, who's the other one? There's a couple of pitching prospects that they brought up. Hunter Green. They brought up. They brought up all their young talent at the same time and said go. And they just got white hot at the same time. Then Joey Votto came back and decided he wanted to be a player again. Starts hitting dingers, and all of a sudden you got a little team there. Uh, they are currently losing to Baltimore two one in a in a in a delay, I guess. But um, that's a team that when you get all your young talent together and you bring them all up, a la the Astros a little bit, you can do stuff like that. You can you can be fun, have all the energy, and those guys just play for each other. And it's like it's it's not like um, how do I put it? They they're not they're not wise enough to what they're doing. They're just going out there having fun, you know, carefree. A lot like Yiner Diaz. I feel like when I watch him play, he is literally a little kid just playing a game, having fun, super joyed, big smile, and that energy is infectious. And then everybody feeds off of it. And then you take that to the plate and you take that to the field. And then you make plays that you probably wouldn't have made just because you're just so locked in. One one take I got for you on the on the on the Yiner front since you brought it up. Do you think there's eventually a point in time? that they could move him from behind the plate to teach him to either play first base or the outfield because of his bat being that good. I do. I just don't know if they will. He already plays first base. Currently he's played first base like four or five times a season. And when, when Abreu was struggling, it was a way to get his bat in the lineup because I don't think Dusty's dumb enough to say this guy can't hit because he can, he just values what Maldi does so much more than anything with you know the offense that he's willing to sacrifice that bat to have Maldi's veteran leadership whatever you want to call it behind the plate and now it's to the point where he can't afford it the team just doesn't have the offense he's DHing every day that he's not catching and it's because his bat plays so much um Abreu signed to a three-year deal It'll be interesting to see if you could go three years before you moved him over there. Their number one catching prospect before the season started was Corey Lee. He's still their number one catching prospect. In my opinion, the guy is a stud. 
and he's crushing it in Sugarland. So it's going to be really interesting to see what they do there if they trade Corey or if they trade Yiner <laughs> because I don't know that you run them both out there. I just don't know. I mean, they're both profile as starting catchers. Could you platoon them? Sure. Can I think Corey play a little first base as well? Absolutely. I don't know what they're going to do. It's a tough, it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's a good problem to have, but it's an interesting problem because it's going to come to a head at some point. Um, I got two things on that front. Could, could we, could we lose one of the two catching prospects at the deadline? Uh, I absolutely think so. I think that is your your number one position of strength for young major league ready talent that isn't on the roster currently. You start to look at Sugarland, you start to look at Corpus. There's names down there that are untouchable in my opinion. Spencer Agetti, he's their I think he's their 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 number two pitching prospect, even though I think he's their number one pitching prospect. He's a big strikeout guy. I've been following him for a while. There's a guy on Twitter named uh, – his handle's is Astros Future. If you're not following him, you should because he's constantly pumping out content for all the, the minor league prospects. And Eric Getty's a guy he put me on. We had him on our podcast once, and he put me on like two years ago. And the kid's done nothing but shine since. Big strikeout guy. Um, I think he's untouchable. I think he should be. I hope he is. Uh, they just moved him to Sugarland, so he's getting that much closer to getting the call up. And then, obviously, uh, Drew Gilbert, who's their number one prospect, who's going to be in the Futures game, I think he's untouchable. So then you start looking, all right, where, where, where are my trade chips that aren't on my roster? Obviously, we've talked about it on, on the relevant app. We've talked about it anywhere you want to talk about Astros baseball. Jokes, uh, McCormick, Myers. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think they do it, but Dubon, all those guys – are pieces I guess you could move to get better. You know, if, you, if you're going to go out and get a bat, it's probably going to be for one of those positions. So I could see some of those guys getting moved. But if you're going to move young talent, I think Corey Lee's got to be at the top. Um, Sean was talking about it before he asked Dana Brown, I think his last interview on Wednesday or Thursday when they had him on, him and uh, Lima and Ryan were talking about how bad is it going to hurt to acquire something at the deadline. And I think everything that I, that in my best estimation, when it comes to baseball knowledge, I feel like they're giving Yiner just enough ABs to move him. Again, it all depends on if you believe Dana Brown. If you believe what he's saying, because he came out personally and said that Yiner is the future catcher of the Houston Astros. So I, if he said that, it, he's going to have to walk that back. And I would think that the cost, like, like, what are you trading Yiner for? Like, if you're trading him, now we're talking about something elite. You better be talking about Dylan Cease. You better be talking about one of the one of those one of those amazing arms. I don't know that there's a bat that I would trade him for that makes a lot of sense. You know what I mean? Like you talk about some of the names that are, that could be available. None of those are worth that prospect in my opinion. Can you send a minor league pitcher and say Corey Jokes? Probably. Can you send a minor league infielder and maybe Chas McCormick or Jake Myers? Probably. The the price tag for Yiner is going to be something steep. Nobody's just going to come to them and hey, we'll send you Lucas Giolito for Yiner Diaz. It's not going to happen. No. The only the only thing I think that they could do is I am paying very close attention to the St. Louis Cardinals when it comes to the Yiner Diaz, and here's why. Early in the deadline, if Contreras is moved, which I think he's going to get moved, because he can't do catcher major league major league catching things like manage the staff, call the game. He can't do it. Seen it in Chicago, can't do it. Can he hit the piss out of the ball? Yes. If Contreras is moved to somebody, which I think they'll ship him anywhere um 
I could see the St. Louis Cardinals giving up Goldschmidt for Abreu and Yiner Diaz. I can't see it. It makes, it makes very little sense. And I'll tell you why. Because the argument against Yiner in Houston, why he's not catching now, is because he can't do the catching things. So you're going to trade him to a club that just got rid of a guy for the same reason? But I think Yiner does it better than Contreras. I think that's I think that's a little biased. I don't I don't know that we can say that. He hasn't caught enough games. Well, because I don't I I just think Maldi's gonna be the guy going down the stretch. And Duffy, And see that's a I for me that's a mistake. And, this team needs punch it from that spot. And if they're not gonna trade for it, they need to give him the job. But I don't think because you you can't put Maldi on the bench. Why can't because, you? Because I, I think Maldi manages – the numbers don't support it. We went over this. We went over this. This is a rabbit hole. This is a rabbit hole. But we went over this. I know the numbers don't support it, but I just feel that Maldi is the guy. I would rather have Maldi behind the plate going into the World Series than I do Yiner. You know, you know, you know, wanted if, if you wanted to trade Yiner, here's the name, and I don't think they'd do it. But if I was going to do it, here's the name that I'd trade him for. Luis Robert Jr. Some sort of package. Some kind of deal. That team's probably going to blow it up anyway. And if they're going to get younger, he's signed long-term on an amazing contract. Like, you're getting value for Luis Robert. And if I'm Dana Brown, if if I want to go at a bat, and I want to add, I mean, he plays center field for them. So... You can plug him right in center field. Yeah. That's 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 a way. If, you, if you're adamant about keeping Maldi behind the dish, then you better go get a bopper. And that maybe that's what he's trying to do. Maybe that is the end game here, is that I have to satisfy Dusty in his demands that he needs more offense because he's not going to give over the keys from Maldi. And that's why he's been saying, I need a bat, I need a bat, I need a bat. Because as much as I like jokes as much as i like jazz as much as i like jake those guys aren't striking fear in the hearts of anybody so you need to go get a dude that you can put behind pena that you can put behind tucker that like i have to pitch to them because i don't want to face luis robert jr i don't want to face whoever the name is but but i think you have to trade for that type of player i don't think you can trade for just a you know a Christian Vasquez level player. Now, since you brought up all those names, are all them guys on the block? Are they available for a package deal? In my mind, they are. In my mind, they are all available for the right price. I don't think that they're, that Dana's going to give them away. I don't think that Dana's just going to send them away because he's got a gluttony. I think that he is going to try to leverage them to get as much as much as he can. Maybe a three-team deal, something creative. I don't know. But if he wants to upgrade center field, because you look at the lineup. If you're not moving Abreu, because I don't think they will, they've invested in him. That's Dana's first signing. So as a GM, I don't think he's going to go and say, ah, I screwed up my first go. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to watch that go out. He's going to play that out. So then you look at the other position on the field. Center field is 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 and is an area you could you could address. Catcher is an area you could address. You're not messing with third. You're not messing with short. You're not messing with second. You're not messing with right. Left field is probably going to be Jordan or Brantley, hopefully. So that's the only two positions on the diamond you can play with. You we just talked about Maldi not going nowhere. So center it's, field, yeah, and uh. Let's uh, pivot pivot to the uh, National League West, which is very, very intriguing to me. I don't know how much you follow the NL West, but it's just been a roller coaster. I mean, Arizona being good, San Francisco coming back from the dead. I watched a couple of their games in the beginning of the year, and I'm like, this team is bad. Now they're 10 games over 500. The Dodgers are, you know, nine games over 500. San Diego, they are paying a lot of money to be in fourth place. San Francisco was a team that I thought was going to be a seller. 
I was looking at their rotation. I was looking at Jock Peterson. I was looking at a lot of guys on that team going, would that fit? Uh, who's their leadoff guy? Um, he was another guy, a center fielder, I think. He was another guy that a lot of people were talking about because San Francisco wasn't going to be in this thing. And now they're smack dab in the middle of it, and I, you can forget it. I mean, uh, uh, let me let me hunt it down real quick. But, yeah, right, that's, no. that's kind of where I think the problem is for the Astros and for a lot of clubs, I think, going into the trade deadline, you just don't know who's going to actually be willing to sell anything. Well, and I think with the expanded playoffs, it really makes teams reconsider, do we really want to trade this guy? Yep. Well, I mean, if, if you're in, if you're in, why would you? <clears throat> I I hate to go out on a limb and say this, but I think the Atlanta Braves are the best team in baseball. They're very good, top to bottom. Their rotation's very good. That kid, Elder, their young kid that just came up, he's very good. I don't see very ch- very many chinks in their armor. I think, I think the biggest thing that Dana Brown is going to do with the Astros – is he's going to turn them into the Atlanta Braves to where it is just nothing but young talent. And with with you being an Astros fan, I mean, go you know, they're they're in the hunt to maybe possibly go for their sixth straight in a, you know, American Seven. League pennant, or seventh straight American League pennant. Yeah, but, I mean, I, I'm very proud to be where we are. I think it's amazing that it's been that consistent. I know, I don't know how hard it or how many times it's been done, but I I believe it's one of the hardest things to do is to be there every year. And uh, I really hope Dana Brown is able to turn us into Atlanta because Atlanta has locked up all their guys for like the next five years. They're just going to be there for the next five or six years. Everybody from uh, Matt Olson to uh, Harris, their center fielder to Albies to Acuna. These guys are all locked up. So they're going to be really good. Their young pitching is really good. Spencer Strider, that kid Elder that I talked about, they got Charlie F. and Morton there for wisdom. I mean, they just have all the the makings of a World Series championship team. Ten strikeouts tonight again for uh, Strider. Ten, he's on, ten <laughs> again. He's on my fantasy roster. I love him. I I I I uh, stopped at the off off track betting. That's what was making me late. I had to pick up some food and then <laughs> got off of work. I was messing around, had to, you know, hit the Costco. It was raining. I had to wait that out. Uh, that's why the uh, Reds in Baltimore, we've been getting some crazy rain up here in the North. And uh, um, I was messing around with all that fun stuff. And then I'm like, I'm going to be like five minutes late for this. And, um, but yeah, I'm looking at the scores right now. The uh, Tigers are up four to two on the Rangers, and uh, Seattle's knotted up with the uh, Capitals. And where I think that's a and the White Sox are up on the Angels. Lebron Way Jr. was the name I was talking about earlier for the uh, uh, San Francisco. Giants. Gotcha. Because one of the things that uh, Dana Brown mentioned was that he was looking at a left-handed bat. He's a left-handed bat. And, uh, like again, if you thought that the Giants are going to be out of it, he would probably be available. There's no reason to think they will be now. Um, and I guess that pretty much sums up Major League Baseball. Can I ask you a couple football questions before you hop off? Absolutely. Shoot. What uh, what are you thinking on CJ Stroud? Are are you a CJ Stroud guy, or would you rather him sit? No, no, no. I'd rather him play. I think that the the mistake that the Texans made the last time they did this was they sat uh, a certain guy that shall not be named because uh, we 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 don't care for him much around these parts anymore. And I think that he proved that he should have played from get go. As much as I think Davis Mills can do a serviceable job, and I think that defense is going to be elite, 
I think that if you're going to let him, if you're going to let him learn, you might as well let him learn on the job. I think that offensive line is going to be great. So he's going to be well protected. The front office and the head coaches talked about running the ball. They've got two really good running backs. There's no reason to put CJ Stroud in harm's way. I don't see him taking the kind of punishment that a rookie quarterback would take with holes in the line or, or a shaky run game. I don't think they're going to ask him to do anything that's going to be too much. I think they're going to keep it really simple for him early on. Dalton Schultz was a great addition for them. I think he's going to be the perfect check down for him. That guy's going to be an all pro. I, I can't say unless he does, unless he gets hurt, like you just see him. And even when he was a cowboy and I can't stand the Cowboys for obvious reasons, because it's, it's a rival. that's not a rival. The guy's just elite. You see him and, 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 and Dak would just lean on him and you could, wouldn't question it because all he did was catch the ball, get you first downs, move the sticks and keep it moving. I think he's going to be so valuable for him. And I think you started from day one. He's looked really good in camp so far. I'm I'm a little biased. I'm an Ohio State guy, so Well then you must love him. <laughs> the the only thing that worries me with with uh with the Stroud Davis Mills thing, I think because I'm looking at the schedule right now, if I was in charge, I would probably start him day one. But I think your guys' schedule is tough. Your first five games are are not. I mean, you open up on the road at Baltimore, then you got to play Indy. But I think the Colts are awful. Even though I live in Indiana, Anthony Richards is terrible. I cannot believe he got drafted fourth overall. That guy couldn't hit a broadside of a barn with a fistful of peanuts. He can throw the goddamn ball through a car wash and not get it wet. Stole that one from Salisbury, but. I mean, he can throw it through a brick wall, but he has no touch on it. And I, don't, I, I just don't see how the fourth pick in the draft goes six and seven at Florida. It was always going to be a prospect. You were trying to catch lightning in a bottle. He was a guy that a lot of people said he, if he had the, the, the reps, if he had the starts, that he would be number one. You know, he's built – He's built for that kind of, uh, you know, punishment. He looks a lot like uh, Cam. Cam. Yes, yes. And I think he's a better version of Cam when he's finished. Indy knows, I think Indy knows anyway, that that is going to be a one to two year project before you even start to get to the point where he's like, okay, now it's CJ Stroud ready. So for me, I actually look at it as a blessing in disguise because I think Indy's going to do the same thing. I think they're going to roll him out right away. I don't think they're going to uh, they're going to mess around with whoever the backup is. Uh, is, it, is it Gardner Minshew? Yeah, I they got yeah. I don't think they're going to mess around with him, and I think they're going to roll him right out, and that's going to hurt them. Now their run game's good, and they've got some some weapons on the, on the outside. So, but you need Richardson to get him the ball. I still like the Texans' chances against Indy twice this year because, like I said, that defense is set up to be so good, and you just know that they're so hungry. I mean, a lot of these guys are on prove-it deals, and when you have that and a young talent, you mix it together, it can be really exciting. I think it's I think it's an exciting time to be a Texans fan, and I think that last year was – I hate to say this, but I think Bill O'Brien fucked that franchise up. Totally disagree. You don't think I'll, so? I'll tell you why. If you go back to the DeAndre Hopkins thing, and that's where a lot of it a lot of it started. DeAndre Hopkins wanted to be paid like a top wide receiver in the league. The Texans did not have the money to do it. So before he got traded, he came out and said, I want a new deal or I want out. So do I think they should have got more? Everyone does. Do I think D Hop wanted out one way or the other? Absolutely. The mistake he made, if you want to call it that, was that he did a solid for his wide receiver. He sent him where he wanted to go. He did not try to get the best deal for the Texans. He got the best deal based on where Desha- or Deshaun, DeAndre wanted to go. Now, if you look at the numbers at DeAndre Hopkins since he left, and uh, 
Um, oh, I'm struggling with the name because I'm I'm got to switch my baseball football mind. Uh, Are you talking about the midget? I might be. He's not a tall guy, but he went to Dallas. <clears throat> uh, Kyler the Archer. Murray? Huh? Oh, oh, you're talking about Archer. I thought you were talking about no, Kyler the wide the wide receiver for the Texans. I'm, oh. I'm struggling with his name, but their production was the same. It would not have changed. I mean, DeAndre got hurt. You know, you can't see injuries coming, but the trade didn't end up being bad from a standpoint of DeAndre Hopkins made the Texans look bad. Did he make some amazing catches? Yes. Did he produce enough to warrant the contract? Absolutely not. If you would have if you would have paid him. Like the Cardinals paid him. There's, I got to believe there's Arizona fans sitting over there, man. Yeah, we got off of that running back, but gosh, we overpaid a lot to get this wide receiver in the building. And I don't think that was the be all end all. I think he was not a general manager. I think the owner screwed that up. The owner made him take on that role because he didn't want to pay a general manager because he was cheap. Yeah. Um, I think Cal realized the error of his ways, Cal McNair, that is. And they said, no, I need a guy. And they went out and hired Casario and the rest is history. Now, it's easy to think, oh, any coach can just pick their own players and do, do all the contracts. It's not. It's not. You look over at Belichick, you see him do it, go, oh, I got all I got to do is give the keys to one of those guys and be good. And that was Cal being young, new on the job. He hadn't had the football team long. That's a rookie mistake. He was a rookie owner. I get that. I'm okay with Cal making that mistake. I also think he did a really good job fixing it. He went through hell and high water to get Casario. He almost got caught tampering to try to get him. Yep. But so far, all that all that guy's done is proven he was worth the risk. He's done a fantastic job. This team is set up to be amazing. Now they had to clean the cupboard. You had to get Deshaun out, and and some some head coaches had to lay on the sword and fall on the sword for that. You know, but now. They have all the cap space. They've got their line locked up. They're looking to lock up Titus Howard. He's the last piece of it. They got young talent. They got draft picks still coming from Deshaun Watson. And they're ready to rock and roll. Next year, they're going to have even more cap space. And I think I think looking at it, when when you're a player in the NFL that wants out and you ask, you ask to be out, like D Hop, you know, it was New Deal or Trade Me. Um, he definitely um, didn't didn't do. He didn't turn over rocks when it came to the Arizona Cardinals. No. And and, and from what I've heard, that that place is a dumpster fire because people don't want to work with Kyler Murray, and they're potentially going to have the number one and number two pick next year, and. No. I bet they do. I, you're, I mean, you're assuming that the Texans are very bad. I don't think they'll be very bad. I think they'll but, win seven games. You think the Texans will win seven games? I do. Let me look at the schedule. Uh, I think they'll struggle at the Ravens. They'll beat the Colts. Jaguars at home, that's going to be tough because I think Lawrence is trending up, which he might they be beat the best. last year with Davis Mills. That is a good point, but Jacksonville got hot at the end. They got. I understand. I, I think they split with Jacksonville. I think they take both from the Colts, though. Yeah, both from the Colts. Um, at Atlanta, that's winnable. The Saints. That's four. That that's winnable. Carolina's a coin flip, but I think because I followed the Panthers really, really close because I'm a big fan of Matt Rule, and I think he got done dirty down there. Because he had no quarterback. He had he built that offensive line in that defense, and the only thing that he needed to do was just have a quarterback. If they just could have stuck it out. But the Panthers went six and two in their last eight games after they got rid of McCaffrey and Robbie the shitbird Anderson. <laughs> we'll see. I think I think that's gonna be a game that the Texans can win. I picked them to win it because I think you got one versus two. You got your guy, the guy from Ohio State, is going to have a chip on his shoulder, thought he should have been the number one pick, and he's going to go out there and light it up. I think he's got better weapons. I love Tank Dell. I think that guy's going to be an absolute monster. I think that John Mechie comes back, Bobby Trees, proven veteran, 
Dalton Schultz, and then you talk about that run game. I think they score 14 points every game. And and, and then you talk about the defense. I mean, there that's Alabama all over again with an Alabama head coach. Those guys breed defense. I think they're going to be fast. I think they're going to be fun. You look at that Niners defense from last year. Everybody went in there, came out, beat up afterwards. I don't see why they can't do that with this young group. I think they went out and handpicked a lot of good guys. Their linebackers are going to be a strength, I think, because D'Amico was a linebacker, and now he's got two great young linebackers there. So, And and I guess I'm biased, but I know that a lot of people are seeing it too. A lot of – if you go – read through some of the socials. They're like, Hey, look out for these Texans. So you put all that together, all these pick them games. I'm picking them now. They could, they could lose them all, but I'm picking them. It's a coin flip. And I think the <clears> big, <throat> because I do some gambling here and there, I think the, uh, the, the, the big thing with, with the Texans is, is I think with them, you're going to see a bunch of spreads under seven. It's going to be a lot of two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, and five and a half because the until the bookmakers get a gauge on them. But I mean, they they also play my Steelers this year, so uh, I think they'll lose that game. Even though that game, JJ Watt, Ring of Honor, it's going to be hell. That one's going to be fun. I can see a scenario where the Steelers win on a field goal late, and it'll be like you tip your cap and you keep it moving. But I think you're going to get the best friggin' Texan game of the season October 1st. Oh, yeah. And that is um, – I don't know how well Kenny Two Gloves is going to be the, coming up this year for the Steelers. Um, there's some grumblings I'm reading on Twitter. If they don't if they don't sure up Tomlin's contract, if, if they let Tomlin go, that's a problem. Oh, you guys are toast. I think Tomlin is the holy guts of that thing. And he is an awesome head coach. And I think that the reason they are always a threat to be great is because of Mike Tomlin. That guy's phenomenal. And also how he kept a lid on the Antonio Brown thing for so long. Yeah. And like, like the biggest thing is, is that like, because I listened to the locals, the local guys there too, uh, the Antonio Brown got like four or five speeding tickets on McKnight Road, which is a big road in Pittsburgh, and it's like 50. So it's a huge speed trap. He was driving like 100 miles an hour down McKnight Road, just like, you know, just doing fuck all. And it's just like, come on, man. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm so glad that he is out of Pittsburgh. I am glad that Le'Veon Bell is out of Pittsburgh and – it sucks that Roethlisberger retired. Now we have Kenny Two Gloves that can't throw the ball on time and underthrows a lot of balls, and he is a worm burner. He throws it in the dirt a lot. I think the Steelers are going to win despite of Kenny Two Gloves. They're going to go nine and eight. I'm rooting for y'all. I'm rooting for every team not named Cleveland in that division. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm I'm captivated right now. The College World Series, the, it's the eighth eighth inning, and the Gators are only down 10. It's only. Four, 14 to 4. They just hit a home run. Well, they got they got two they got two uh two goes at it. <laughs> Not looking good, but uh I guess that's that's pretty much it. Uh when when are you and Rob uh streaming again on relevant? That is a great question. Give me just one second. I will get you the answer you need. And Tom, I'm going to I'm going to throw this on my YouTube channel as well and I'm not going to edit it at all from uh the recording from when when we started the stream to when we end the stream. Cool, cool. Um see i want to say it's the second that's what i want to say let me transfer over to the astros schedule because you guys pretty much on there all take turns since you guys have uh we actually have like a uh a, a, a pdf that goes out and everybody kind of picks their uh 
they pick what I guess what they can do. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, we kind of duke it out for all the different times. Let's see. Astros and aneurysm. Yep. July 2nd, 135. It will be Rob and myself. That's when you guys are on. What is that's Sunday? Oh, you you got the you got the good stuff. Oh yeah. The, the Rangers. Yep, yep. Uh yeah. I'll definitely be able to catch you guys on that. Uh well, October first, Texans, Texans Steelers. I know I'll be watching it and I'm gonna try to do a show every Sunday when the Steelers play or whoever plays. Um, if you wanna you wanna do a show with me when the Texans are on, I'll be watching it. Okay. Um I'll let me check with Rob. I know we have a Texans podcast that we just started that um we're gonna probably gear up. We've also got another guy that we work with who's got his own thing going on. And uh, a lot of the same things, you know, we're just in there passionate about, you know, the Texans and what they're doing and how they can be better. Uh, but if I can get away, I'll definitely come on. You know, appreciate you having me on today. This is a lot of fun. And um, I'm always down. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm starting out. I'm just starting out. So the viewers are not. <laughs> it's how it is, man. It's how it is. But the grind is, is something that's really fun as you build the base and guys come in and, you know, you, you love getting that reaction, that feedback, being able to talk stuff out. So keep doing it. Keep going. All right, man. I'm going to end the stream. You have a good night. Thanks for coming on. And uh, this will go up on my YouTube channel and I can send you the link. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Yep. No problem.